Right, folks, shall we turn to 1 John chapter 1? 1 John chapter 1, we continue our series in this wonderful book of 1 John. I'm going to pick up the reading from verse 5 this evening. 1 John chapter 1, from verse 5 through to verse 10. Let's give God's word our full attention. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Let's pray. Father, as we come to hear your word now, we pray Help us to hear with faith. Move our hearts to repentance. Help us trust again in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Help us to walk in the light. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I have three very simple points to make from this text this evening. And all of these points revolve around the idea of the light. Walking in the light. And I want to show you these three things this evening. First, John talks about the source of light. Second, he talks about the sinner in the light. And then he talks about the Savior in the light. Now, here's why you need to understand this text. If you don't believe what John has to say right here, if you contradict it, if you're ignorant of it, and if you die in that state, you will die in your sins and you will be lost forever. That's how serious the ideas are in this text. Why do I say that? Well, because this text is about the nuts and bolts of the gospel itself. These are the basics of the gospel. If you deny or contradict these things, you're not saved. You're lost in your sin, and you will be totally hopeless on Judgment Day. So I hope I have your attention. Now let's get into the text. John talks about the source of light. Look at verse 5 once again. He says, this is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Now what does John mean that God is light? Does he mean he is that stuff that beams from the sun in the middle of our solar system? Does he mean that God is the stuff that's beaming off these light bulbs here tonight? Is God that light? Well, no, obviously not. God is not physical light. John is using a picture here. It's a metaphor. God is beyond nature, okay? They can't be talking about this kind of light. What does he mean, though? What does it mean that God is light? Well, in this context, it means that God is truth. God is truth. Why do I say that? If you look at verse 6, he basically equates walking in the light with practicing the truth. Okay? He talks about walking in the darkness, and he contrasts that with practicing the truth. To walk in the light is to walk in the truth. Light here is truth. He says, if we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Light is truth. Yes, light does represent many other things about God, his purity, his holiness, all of those things, but but here in this context, it's about truth. The psalmist often refers to God in this sense. Psalm 43, verse 3 says, Send out 
your light and your truth. And let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. Do you see how the ideas of light and truth are coupled together? Light is truth. And friends, that makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Light reveals things. Truth reveals things. Just like the lights in this building tonight reveal the surroundings. Uh, If someone had to turn off all of the lights, which ESCOM enjoys doing, if, if we had to have all of the lights removed here, we would be very uncomfortable, wouldn't we? We would have to grope our way around the building. We, we wouldn't be aware of what we could trip over. We would bump into each other and all get COVID. Okay? We, we would be in trouble. We need light to reveal the world, to reveal things. And likewise, truth reveals things, reveals the world. When John says God is light, it means God is the ultimate revealer of things. He helps us understand who we are, what this world is, why we're here, all of these wonderful things. He helps us to understand these things. C.S. Lewis famously put it like this. He says, I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen, not only because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. And we could equally say, we could equally say, I believe in God as I believe that the sun has risen, not only because I see him, but because by him I see everything else. God is Light, God is truth, he is the source of truth. My friends, you need to know this. This is extremely important. The Christian faith doesn't claim to be one truth of many truths. The Christian faith claims to be the very truth of God. To walk in this light means to know the truth. And God never spins stories. God never distorts reality. God never tells you things that don't exist. God is perfect. He's not like us. We twist the truth. We leave elements of truth out. We put elements into what we call truth that don't belong there. And this world is full of untruth. Okay, but God is never like that. He is light. He is light. And in him there is no darkness at all. But notice, John says God is light. He doesn't say God is a light. Let me illustrate the difference to you like this. You know, when you go to Burmeses, and you want to buy a nice new measuring tape. How do you know that measuring tape is accurate? Do you compare it to the other measuring tapes on the rack to make sure it's accurate? Well, the answer is no. Because they could be wrong. You need the source. You need to understand that this measuring tape in my hand measures up to the universal standard, okay? There has been a standard set. The first standard of the meter was legislated by the French government in the month of April 1795. And they even put a monument up in Paris to show the public what a meter should look like. There it is. And that was the standard for a very, very long time, for many, many years. If you wanted to know if your measuring tape was accurate, well, there it was. You could test it. That was the standard. Now, when God, oh, sorry, when John says God is light, he is saying God is the standard of truth. All other things, all other truth claims in this world need to be measured up to what God has to say. He is the standard. 
He is light. Truth cannot be measured by our own opinions or feelings. His word is truth. Now, friends, do you believe that? Do you actually believe that? Do you measure your thoughts of yourself and of the world by God's word? Are you walking in that light? Or are you just swayed to and fro like everyone else in the world, mixed up by their own opinions, by their own feelings of how things should be? Friends, if if we don't walk in the light, we are deluded. God is truth. God is light. And so I wonder tonight, have you seen the light? God is light. Now, we need to ask the question, what should this light do to us? What, What does God want to reveal to us that's so important? This brings us to the next main point. The sinner in the light. Look at verses 8 to 10. John says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. See, friends, here's what happens. When God's light dawns in your heart and in your life, you're going to realize that you are a sinner. That's one of the effects of this light. What is sin? Well, friends, John actually defines sin. Turn over to John chapter, 1 John 3, verse 4. 1 John 3, verse 4. John says, Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. There it is. When you are in God's light, you're going to see lawlessness in your own heart. That's what's going to become clear to you. Uh, It's not hard to illustrate what lawlessness is in a country like ours, full of lawlessness, from people treating traffic rules like mere suggestions, to gunmen shooting up a tavern, to astronomical amounts of government corruption. We have no shortage of examples of lawlessness. But worse than all of that, lawlessness is breaking God's law. Lawlessness here is not just breaking the country's law. Lawlessness in John's sense here, in John's mind, is breaking God's law. Think of the Ten Commandments. Lawlessness is worshiping idols. Lawlessness is blaspheming God. Lawlessness is breaking his Sabbath. It's rebelling against authority. It's murder, it's adultery, it's theft, it's lying, and it's good old common garden variety covetousness. When you envy what your neighbor has, when you're bitter about your neighbor's happiness and his success, that is lawlessness. Now, John tells us that when you walk in the light, when the light of God has dawned in your life, you're going to see who you are exactly as you are. No illusions, no deceptions, no facade. Look at what he says again, verse 8. If we say we have no sin, we have deceived ourselves and the truth is not in us. Verse 10. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. That's, that's present tense sin and past tense sin. I have sin and I have sinned. Both are true. If you have God's light in your life, you will see it. Let me illustrate it to you like this. Imagine you are walking down a dark alleyway in a city. 
and the street lights around this alleyway are not working. It is pitch dark. You have to go through. So you try to run through as quickly as you can, but as you're running through, you trip and you fall into a puddle of something that feels wet. You get up and you try and brush yourself off, but you can't see what it is. You, you're looking for lights, and so you run to the nearest street light that you can see, and the closer you get, you look down and you realize, oh no, I've fallen into a puddle of pitch black, sticky car oil. It is all over your clothes, it's all over your, your shirt, your pants, your shoes, it's now on your hands, it's on your face, you're covered in it. Well, that's what it's like when we approach God who is light. It exposes the awfulness of our sin, the the awfulness of our guilt before God. And scripture often describes it as a stain, as a filthy stain all over your life. Uh, The psalmist explains it like this in Psalm 90. He says, You, that's God, you have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. Yeah, even those secret sins will be brought to light. Those sins that you hope no one will ever find out about. Those secret thoughts and imaginations that you secretly savor in your heart are exposed by God. God knows about those thoughts and he brings them to light in your conscience. Maybe, maybe God's doing that right now in your heart. I hope he is. Maybe he is exposing those flaws once again. And maybe it's making you feel very uncomfortable. Maybe you're resenting this right now and you think, oh no, not again. Not again. Well, friend, let me tell you, To have your conscience exposed is one of the kindest things God can do for you. God is not showing it to you just to humiliate you. He's showing you the danger that you're in so that you will run to him for safety and rescue. He's showing you the problem of your heart so that you will run to him for the solution. God is showing you what terrible danger you're in. It's the best thing he can do for you. Let me illustrate it to you like this. I'm borrowing John Piper's words here. John says, when the lights are turned off in a room, you might be there with a horrid black monster called sin ready to devour you. You may also be with a great knight in shining armor called Christ ready to save you, but you can't see because you're in the dark. And in the dark, the predatory monster might have a warm furry coat that feels attractive And the armor of the night might feel cold and forbidding. Friends, that's that's the danger we're in when we don't have God's light exposing the danger of sin. In the darkness of our own self-delusion, of our own self-righteousness and self-justification, we could completely confuse a predator for the Prince of Peace. That's, that's how dangerous this can get for us. So we need his light to, con- to expose sin. Now you might be wondering, are there really people who deny this? Are there really people who, who claim that they have no sin and that they have not sinned? As John is describing here. Well, friends, there are actually many people who deny it. Many, many people deny that they sin. Here's what I mean. Many people will say, I'm not perfect. I have flaws. I make mistakes. But what they mean is, I'm I'm a good person deep down and I just make mistakes. I just slip up like everyone else. And, you know, I know I hurt people, but there's grace, there's forgiveness. I'm only hurting people Maybe I'm hurting myself, but it's not so bad. You know, the real bad guys are the guys in prison, uh, the politicians, uh, the criminals on the loose, but not me. Yeah, I make mistakes occasionally. I don't really mean that. What are they missing, friends? Well, they have lowered the bar. And what they claim is sin is not really sin. 
They're actually excusing themselves. What they're missing is that the bad things that they do are an offense to the God of the universe. They are committing treason in their sins. They are offending the thrice holy God who has every right to throw them into hell forever for those sins. We're not just making mistakes. We are offending God. You see, these people are like the character I described running through the alley. When they trip and fall into the puddle, they feel the mess. But they don't run toward the light because they don't want to see how bad it really is. They don't want to have to cope with the mess. And so they hide themselves from the light and they cover it up with all sorts of silly language. And John talks about this. John knows everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his works should be exposed. There are actually very few people in this world who are enlightened enough and who are courageous enough to face their own sin. Very few people. A couple of months ago, I was flipping through my YouTube feed and a faith TV broadcast popped up. It was called Faith Revival 3.0. And I was curious, I, I don't often listen to that sort of thing, and I had some free time, and I hadn't listened to that speaker who was being broadcast that particular day. His name is Jonathan Shuttlesworth. So I listened for a few minutes out of curiosity, and I could not believe my ears. This man was boasting that he doesn't sin. Yes, you heard me right. He, he was boasting about the fact that he doesn't sin anymore. And he didn't go into in-depth in- explanation. Uh, he didn't explain the theology behind why he was saying that. He moved on to other ideas, so I kind of left it at that. But it stuck in my mind, and it came up again when I was studying this text. I was amazed. So what I did was a bit of research, and my wife helped me. We ended up finding a podcast that Jonathan Shuttlesworth taught, which he entitled Eight Essential Ingredients to Live a Sin-Free Life. So I thought that sounds interesting. And we got listening to it. And he explains in detail how a Christian can completely overcome sin and live a perfectly sin-free life. I thought this is quite interesting. And at the end of the podcast, he even started mocking churches who publicly confess sin. Now, I want to just show you some of his words from the end of this podcast. They really are amazing. He says, he's now talking about his own personal conviction. He says, we need to confess. Thank you that I'm pure. Thank you that I'm righteous. Thank you that I'm holy. Don't confess anything else. I don't care if they tell you to repeat it from the platform. Keep your mouth shut. They pray. Father, we come to you today as sinners. Lord, we are professional screw-ups. Lord, we are just broken people. Uh, I know. You can pray it. You're on your own, champ. Have you noticed that there's no anointing on that prayer? The devil behind you, uh, sorry, the devil is behind you clapping going, Great prayer. I couldn't have come up with a more deep prayer myself. And I found that very ironic that he uses foul language in his podcast. They pray, Father, we confess to you today that we are broken people. We are messy people. And you've chosen to go there and have your children listen to that. I don't think your brain works properly, to be honest with you. So there it is, friends. This man has 60,000 followers on YouTube. 60,000 followers. And this preacher is celebrated by the River Church in our city. Celebrated and promoted. They love him. 
And friends, all I can say with all due respect is shame on the River Church for promoting such a heretic. Shame on them. That this man can publicly mock the Bible's teaching. That he has publicly denied our ongoing need to repent and confess our sins to our God. It's heresy. I mean, look at what John has just said to us in verse 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. This man is also denying the Lord's Prayer, which is a daily prayer for forgiveness. The Lord Jesus taught us to pray like this. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts. As often as we need to ask God to provide for us, we need to ask him to forgive us. This is Jesus. Friends, it is a mockery of the gospel. And people run after it. People praise this kind of preaching. They hang on every word that this guy says. It's heartbreaking. It makes me angry to see the word of God twisted and mocked like that. Let me say to you this evening, I will be the first to confess that I am a great sinner who needs a great savior every day, every day, every hour, every minute. That's what the light of God shows us in our hearts. And I'm so glad that he's done that for me. I don't care how bad it makes me feel about myself. I'm not trying to justify myself. I'm not going to try and make myself look better than what I am. Friends, I'm not going to pretend I don't have it all under control, and neither do you. We need grace every day. And I wonder, has God shone his light into your heart? Has God exposed your sin? Has he convicted your heart that you have broken his law and that you deserve death? Do you realize how much grace that you need every day, every hour, every minute, every second? If we deny this, we have such a low view of God and such a high view of ourselves. It's unbelievable. I hope that's not us, friends. I hope that's not you. Why does God enlighten us about our sin? Is it just to make us feel bad? Is it just to crush us? Is it just to humiliate us? No, friends. This brings us to the last main point. The Savior in the light. The Savior in the light. Look at verse 8 once again. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, here's the sweet truth of the gospel. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Right now, I don't think we could find sweeter words than those. God doesn't just bring up our sin to humiliate us, to crush us, to condemn us. No, he, he brings up the problem so that he can show us the solution. And the solution is right there. It's the Savior himself in the light. Who is the Savior who's able to erase our sin? Look at verse 7. Look at verse 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Jesus is that savior. Jesus. Now let's look at the conditions of this cleansing that he offers us. How do we, how do we get hold of this cleansing blood? The first thing we need to do is confess. Do you see that? If we confess that we have sin. Friends, we need to humble ourselves before God and confess. Confess. Maybe you're cherishing an idol in your heart this evening. Maybe you resent 
an authority figure in your life. Maybe you're super angry with someone. It might even be your spouse or or one of your children or a friend. Uh, Maybe you're lusting after someone in your heart. Maybe you're lying about something or trying to cover something up. Maybe you're just envious. You're living in misery because you heard that one of your friends has got a promotion and you don't. And you feel so sorry for yourself. Well, friends, God knows. And and now's the time to confess. To confess our sin to God. And that means that you need to think about your sin. You need to think about how the fact that it's broken God's law and offended him. You need to think about how it grieves him and how it grieves others in your life. You need to beg God to help you do this sincerely. Confess your sins. And then confess the sins you're not even aware of. Say in your heart to God, God, I don't even know all of my sin. I'm not even aware of all the things that I've done wrong, of all the ways in which I've fallen short. So confess your ignorant sins. And then confess the fact that your confession is not perfect. Confess to God that, if his, de- if his grace depended on a perfect confession of faith, we would have no hope. So confess the fact that your confession is not perfect. It may be flawed with self-righteousness, ignorance, pride. What if you don't confess? Well, if God loves you, here's what will happen to your heart. I'm going to read Psalm 32 David says, for when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord And you forgave the iniquity of my sin, Psalm 32. If God loves you, he will put his hand heavily on you. And it will feel like he's crushing you, that guilt, that burden. But he actually wants you to run to him for relief. And he will give that. So friend, maybe the depression and anxiety you are feeling tonight is because you have unconfessed sins in your heart and in your life. And you need to run to God. You need to stop running away like Adam in that garden. When he had messed up, he was running away and he was trying to cover himself up. That is only going to make it worse. Run to God for that relief. Humbly confess. That's the first condition of forgiveness. But look at the second condition of this cleansing. He says, we need a savior who's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Now just think about that for a moment. What does it mean that he is faithful to forgive sin? Well, it means this. He is totally committed to forgiving our sin. It means that he will not drop the ball. He will not get tired of it. He enjoys it. He is satisfied by it. He is glorified in it. He will not get frustrated. He will not strike us down one day when he has a bad mood. He is faithful. He is consistent. He keeps his word. If we confess our sins, he will forgive us. That is his promise to us. And John says he is also just to forgive us. Now that's amazing. What what does that mean? It almost sounds like forgiveness is our right. That it's justice to forgive us. Doesn't sound quite right, does it? We would expect John to say he is faithful and gracious to forgive our sins. Not faithful and just to forgive us. Why just? Well, friends, here's the amazing truth. On that cross, Jesus canceled out all the debt of our sin. 
on that cross where Jesus was slaughtered, justice was satisfied for his church, for his sheep. And so it would be unjust for Jesus to refuse one of his sheep forgiveness. That's how amazing the gospel is. Let me illustrate it like this. Imagine your bank sends you a notification and they tell you that they have canceled all of your debt. And you look on your banking app and all of your debt has been canceled. Would it be just of them to debit your account the next month for your old debt? No. Because they've told you that they've canceled it and you could see that they had canceled it. It would be unjust of them to go back on their word, to go back on their commitment. And so friends, that's, that's kind of like the gospel. All of the debt of the church was paid on that cross. And so Jesus cannot condemn his people. He will not. It would be unjust. That's the amazing power of justification through the cross. And so when we come to him and confess to our faithful and just Savior, we can know that there is cleansing. There is forgiveness. And notice that little word, cleansing from all unrighteousness. Just let that little word settle in your heart tonight. All unrighteousness. Not some unrighteousness, not many kinds of unrighteousness, all unrighteousness, all law-breaking, all kinds of sin. Yes, even the sin that you hope to God no one will ever find out about. There is cleansing for that too. What does it mean to be cleansed? It means to be washed means to be scrubbed clean. And when the Savior scrubs you clean, he doesn't do a half job. It is cleansing. You will be white as snow. As the wonderful hymn goes, there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. So friends, let me ask you tonight, what do you do when you know you've done something wrong? What do you do? You try and justify yourself? You try and make up excuses that it wasn't so bad or I'm probably not going to get caught or I just made a mistake? Is that what you do with your sin? Well, friends, that's like running away. That's like what Adam did in that garden, running away, hiding from God. I hope that you're not doing that. I hope, friends, that you are running to him. He is offering you the solution tonight. Running away from him because you're sinful is like running away from medicine because you're sick. It doesn't make any sense. You need to run to him and let that light shine on you. Let's pray together. Father, we want to thank you for this very encouraging text about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we pray that we would all be in the light, that we would all walk in this light that John is talking about, the light of truth that exposes our sin and that shows us to the Savior. May we all be completely covered, surrounded immersed in that holy, wonderful truth and light. I pray for unbelievers here tonight, those who are covering up their sin, those who are trying to justify it, those who are effectively running away from you and trying to hide away from you. I pray that that your light would find them and that they would be humbled and not humiliated, but that they would find the solution, the cleansing, the justification, the freedom, the joy that comes through having sins forgiven. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.